There is a good chance we have struggled with drugs since the beginning. Drugs like opium, magic mushrooms, and really anything psychoactive. Anthropology can now confirm that for over 10,000 years, our ancestors have been cultivating them for personal use. Since prehistoric times, our species has enjoyed the pastime of mashing up different plants in our environment. We were hoping they would turn into some sort of paste we could either smoke, smear, or ingest into our bodies. We would then celebrate on the discovery of any combination that would alter our perception, our mood, or our brain. Hello and welcome to Frontline. Thanks for coming. Today I want to have a discussion with you about the human nature of drug abuse, why we won't stop abusing them in the future, and how we might achieve a measure of success towards saving lives. Our history runs deep when it comes to recreational drug use. Early humans traveling over the frozen Bering Strait to North and South America are known to have stopped to gather fly agaric, a hallucinogenic mushroom. Recurrent motifs in ancient Egypt depict the personal use of water lilies that hold intense psychoactive properties. We have good evidence that drug use was rampant in the ancient world where opium and cannabis were already widely available. As these popular substances made their way across Europe, they were embraced by the poor and rich alike. Queen Elizabeth commenced the import of Indian opium into the UK in 1606. Napoleon's battle-weary soldiers brought barrels of hashish back with them from Egypt. By the time morphine was discovered in 1805, the discovering pharmacist Frederick Saturner knew what he had. He named his new substance after Morpheus, the god of sleep and dreams. As the years progressed, we found what really worked for us, and as our numbers and use increased, so did our pushback on these drugs. As the modern ages became more connected, it was much easier to notice the negative aspects of their use, and it became much harder to ignore. Oh, now I'm one with the universe. I'm God and Jesus, Joe. I'm going up there. I'm going up like the airplanes and the rockets. The debate was now here to stay. It was in the open, and the popular question became, should recreational drug use continue to be embraced in a modern society? For the longest time, that answer was a resounding yes. We had embraced morphine as a wonder drug. We fought two wars over the opium trade. And when the incredibly popular drink Coca-Cola made its debut in 1885, it was named partly for its use of coca leaves as a primary ingredient. Fast forwarding to the 21st century, popular opinion had changed again. After improved research came to light and one too many celebrity overdoses, people had enough and governments cracked down none more severely than the United States of America, who declared war on drugs in 1971, a full-blown Nixon policy which committed the country to a law enforcement solution. Despite initially stating that interdiction and eradication programs were destined to fail, the Nixon administration failed to listen to their own advice. Soon after his declaration of war on drugs, the budget launched itself into orbit spending billions a year for those exact eradication and interdiction policies, while at the same time cutting the budget for education, prevention, and rehabilitation programs. The war on drugs is now widely considered a failure, a disastrous policy created from self-interest, ignorance, and racial bias. Looking at the numbers, the US alone has spent over $1 trillion on bloating police budgets as they began to militarize in an escalation of force with drug gangs. Today, some estimates have the spending at nearly $50 billion annually. These numbers have become much harder to justify when there is so much anger regarding the cost and availability of healthcare and education. To make matters worse, the profoundly misguided racial impact on minorities cannot be overstated. Despite the research showing us that white and black citizens use and sell drugs at a similar rate, African Americans comprise 74% of those imprisoned for drug possession. Due to racially driven policies such as carding and stop and frisk, people of color have historically been a prime target during the war on drugs. Using race to scare the public and pass unjust laws is definitely nothing new. In the early 1900s, the images of black men high on drugs were used to pass the earliest prohibition laws. The track record for Latino and other non-white populations is equally as disturbing. All of this brings us into the climate we have today, with an over-militarized police force, countless lives destroyed, 
and hundreds of thousands of people in jail or with a criminal record for simple possession of drugs as common as cannabis. So, knowing this, are there any good reasons we should continue fighting this war on drugs? First, we should look at if it's even possible to eradicate the use of those drugs we deem illegal in modern society. After nearly 50 years and spending currently at 50 billion US dollars a year, it is estimated we capture less than 10% of all illicit drugs. Researching for this video, I was told to ask myself a simple question. Does 50 billion dollars a year for a 90% failure rate sound like a good investment? What will it cost us to capture the other 90%? And are we willing to pay that price? If your answer is yes, okay, then let's carry on the discussion. Does $50 billion a year sound like a good investment when we know over half of Americans cannot or have difficulty accessing healthcare? What about you, Canada? Should we spend over $11 billion a year on the fight and expenses from drug use when 30% of Canadians have said money is the primary reason they cannot attend higher education? Many arguments will tell us, damn the cost, think of the children. They're referring to science literature which tells us that our brains can continue to develop until 25 years of age, and using drugs up to that time can lead to longer term effects such as difficulty with problem solving and increased erratic emotional behavior. This is a valid point, however the reality is that other nations that loosened drug laws saw no significant increase in substance abuse among minors, while some actually saw a decrease. What about the cost of the drug user on the healthcare system? Driving up the cost of insurance or using tax dollars that could be used elsewhere? Yes, if you are a heavy drug user, you may need medical services more than the average healthy abstaining citizen. But not always, and not as much as you think. Your choice to abuse any of the wide range of currently legal drugs or simply to have an unhealthy lifestyle is statistically more likely to send you to the emergency department. Drug substance abuse has no chance of catching up to the effects on health and spending that tobacco and alcohol cause. You are also more likely to catch a ride to the emergency department by abusing valid prescription drugs or simply because you lead an unhealthy lifestyle. What about those needles we see in our community? Yes, those are a danger, but largely because we refuse to adopt the practices that work. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimates that only 22% of accidental needle sticks reported occur during or after disposal. Most of these are incurred by the users themselves, often due to a lack of opportunity to properly dispose of the needle. Communities that go on to embrace the research and implement safe injection sites have shown a massive decrease in overdose deaths, ambulance calls, and infection rates among users. Safe injection sites save lives, reduce costs, and the need for emergency health care to intervene. Yet, only about 100 supervised injection sites operate around the world, mostly in Europe, Canada, and Australia. Change has been slow due to negative public perception, leftover taboo from the years of drug propaganda, and a lack of specific education on drugs. A point that is often overlooked in the argument is how safe injection sites act as a junction for education and rehabilitation. Insight, a facility in Vancouver, has operated for over 15 years, overseen 3.6 million injections, and responded to more than 6,000 overdoses. And no one has ever died there. They also saw no signs of drug use increasing due to their presence or services offered. Harm reduction programs and overdose education services like this are on the front line of the growing fentanyl epidemic. They work to allow users who become addicted access to direct and personalized assistance, allowing them a way back from the brink. Strategies like this must continue in the discussion as I think it sits near the heart of the problem. That is, people will do whatever they want, especially if it feels good. So people are gonna use whether we intervene or not. So why not give them the opportunity to connect to services? And they're just people who should be treated with respect. To understand what success might look like, we should understand what we are losing with our current practices. There was 67,367 drug-involved overdose deaths reported in the U.S. in 2018, both illicit and prescription. Opioids are responsible for at least 47,000 of these cases, the vast majority being given by a doctor. But that's a different conversation, 
all in itself. Canada is struggling with how to handle its own opioid problem. From 2016 to 2019, we had an estimated 12,800 deaths. Sadly, Canada remains one of the largest per capita consumers of prescription opioids in the world. If society wants this to change, then the numbers tell us we need to allow better access to rehabilitation. Upwards of 20 million Americans in 2017 were identified as needing treatment for a substance use disorder. Only 4 million ever received treatment. This is due to one or more factors which include the cost of rehabilitation, the availability of the programs, or a general belief that they did not require help in the first place. After hearing about the success of these programs, it might start sounding like the answer to the problem is yet more money. Although these initiatives have been proven to combat drug abuse, I don't believe they alone can solve the entire problem. Countries like Portugal agree, and they have tried something new, something a little more radical. In 2001, Portugal decriminalized the possession of all drugs for personal use. 20 years later, we can now look to the results for a possible option. The results show that after nearly two decades, Portugal's drug situation has improved significantly in every key area. There was no dramatic rise in substance abuse, as some lawmakers hypothesized. Infections plummeted, while drug-related deaths, incarceration, and drug-related crime saw dramatic drops. A key to their success, and an area I think we are failing, is the reduction of the stigma that goes along with being a drug user. Rather than being arrested, those caught in Portugal with a personal supply might be given a warning, a small fine, or told to appear before a local commission such as a doctor, lawyer, or social worker. Here they would discuss treatment, harm reduction, or other available support services, all of which are strictly volunteer. As Dr. Zhao Gulao, the policy architect, put it, the biggest effect has been to allow the stigma of drug addiction to fall, to let people speak clearly and to pursue professional help without fear. This concept shouldn't sound completely foreign to you either. These are the same practices that North America is now taking on the cannabis industry, and again, we did not see any significant increase in abuse here either. So if we take a look at Portugal today, yes, it still has substance abusers. Of course, it wasn't the be-all, end-all solution. They still deserve a win though. After all, their drug-related mortality rate fell to around four deaths per million people. The average in Europe is 22 deaths per million, while the US sits at an alarming 21 deaths per 100,000. Beside losing the stigma, the data shows us that adopting a more inclusive drug policy can lead to fewer human rights violations, revenue from a cannabis industry, reduction in incarceration and prison populations, and maybe even a stop to overblown police budgets that seem to push arrest quotas and the questionable policy of civil forfeiture. Now that nations like Portugal and others have shown us we have different options, I hope you notice that their success has started from acceptance and acknowledgement, instead of simply waging a war on citizens that choose drugs we now deem illegal. Okay guys, if you made it this far, I want you to give this video a like. Then I want you to ask yourself the same question I was asked earlier. Are the resources we are spending, counted in both people and money, worth the 10% of drugs we remove from the streets? What will it take to remove the other 90%? I don't know that answer, but I can tell you we can't afford it. And we won't label any solution a success if it continues to encourage racism, mass incarceration, or social divide. So this can be a difficult question of me to ask, but I want you to consider these options for those we still have with us and those we may lose in the future. Is there a better way to save their lives? As humans, we have always favored what gives us the ability to escape our reality, to relax from our hardships, or simply to indulge in what makes us feel better. It doesn't seem like we are coping any better now with our reality than we did several thousand years ago. And judging by the last few years, I don't expect the near future to be any different. If nothing else, this beloved pastime deserves a fresh new look now that we understand it better. As a Swiss physician once wrote regarding drug abuse in the 16th century, Poison is in everything, and no thing is without poison. It's the dosage that makes it either a poison or a remedy. America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. In order to fight and defeat this enemy, it is necessary to wage a new all-out offensive. I have asked the Congress to provide the legislative authority and the funds 
to fuel this kind of an offensive